Good evening. This is woodblock printmaker Dave Bolt here at my carving bench on the these days very quiet first floor of our shop in Asakusa, Tokyo. It is now getting on for a year and a half since the shop closed for the duration of the pandemic and from where I sit I am still completely unable to predict when we may be able to open again. But enough of that stuff. Let's not go there. Let's just get on with our video. Today's video is not exactly a sequel, it's more of an update. We are going to talk about our Great Wave print again. It has been in production now since late 2015, just around six years, and we have made a lot of copies of it. People are getting worried about the blocks, and it's time to address those concerns. So this will be episode 17 of our series of videos on this print. I'm sure though that not all people watching this have seen all of the 16 previous videos. Get your binge on if you haven't. So I'll start with a very quick recap of what this project has been all about. It started in the early summer of 2014. I made the decision to go for broke and signed a lease on the Asakusa building. It was just for the second floor at first. We had a budget for the project and thought we could pull it off but almost immediately we began to run into expenses over and above what I had calculated. I was convinced though that our future here could be stable and as I had no access to traditional sources of business funding, loans and stuff like that, we went to Kickstarter to pull us through. Now Kickstarter, Kickstarter isn't all about donations, it's actually a kind of a shopping. So we needed a product to offer, one that would attract the support that we needed. Well. This was the project I proposed, very different from the video game prints for which we had become noted back then. I really had no idea if there would be much interest in such a sort of a boring reproduction of an old print, but I needn't have worried. The Kickstarter page went live one day in August 2014 and cleared its goal 78 minutes later. <laughs> we ended up taking orders for something over 200 copies of the print. Production began that winter in December of 2014, and in what turned out to be one of the smartest things I have ever done, I decided to take the time and trouble to quite thoroughly document what I was doing in some videos for YouTube. I think I originally had the idea that it would take three, maybe four episodes. I mean, it's a simple reproduction. I had done this kind of thing literally hundreds of times before. Trace the thing, carve a set of blocks, print some, wrap it up and move on. <laughs> Three or four videos. I couldn't have been more wrong. For the whole story you'll have to watch the videos, but here I can just mention that for many many reasons the project turned out to be a lot deeper and more complex than I had anticipated. I learned a great deal about printmaking during that year, but we did finally get through it all. And the shipment of finished prints to the Kickstarter backers began in December of uh, that year, 2015. We had a special embossing for the Kickstarter backers, mentioning the campaign and numbering the prints in that group in the order that people had signed up. And then once the campaign obligation was cleared, we added the print to our general catalog for anybody who wanted one. These subsequent copies have no numbering, as with all of our general publications, and have been embossed as you see here. Translated as Image Katsuka Hokusai, Carving David Bull, and then printing, and then the name of the printer goes in there. Regular viewers of our Twitch live streams see me doing this embossing on another batch of the prints every mm, six weeks or so is our goal. So far, three different printers have worked on this project with me. Shinkichi Numabe, who you saw in the videos from back then, was followed by Kenichi Kubota, and he was followed in turn by a young man who had earlier apprenticed with him, Shun Yamamoto. We're now about to bring in a new face. More about her later. Now, with that background here, what's today's episode going to be about and why am I doing this now? As I mentioned, Shipping of the Great Waves began in December of 2015. Two years then passed smoothly by. We received orders for the print, we made more copies, but along the way I started to get emails and communication from people who knew of the history of the project and looking at their calendar, one year, two years, three years, they began to get concerned about our print. Everybody seems to know that wood blocks wear out, so was it safe to order our print? Might they receive a copy badly printed from worn out blocks? 
I got these emails and this was of course a very legitimate concern. So I made a follow-up video to the previous series. I addressed these concerns. That was episode 16, published just over three years ago. I'll of course link to it in the YouTube description below. Now in that video, I talked about block wear. I showed a number of close-ups of both the wood blocks and of prints taken from them, and I believe I allayed the majority of the concerns, showing that there was very little visible difference in the recent prints, and that I was confident the blocks had quite some life left. Well, here we are nearly four years later, <laughs> and as they say, what's the expression? It's deja vu all over again. People out there are worried about these blocks, as of course am I. It's time to address the concerns again, to do some very close-up inspections and see what we can learn about wear and tear on wood blocks for a very popular ukiyo-e print. And to answer the big question, are they still printable? Okay, to get started, let's run the numbers on how many prints we have actually made so far with this block set. If you have watched previous videos in this series, you'll know that it actually took us quite some time to get the thing into stable production, even after the basic block set was ready. I had a particular image in mind for how I wanted our edition to look, but the men who did the early printing for me, having made more copies of the Great Wave than they've had hot dinners. They had a different print in mind, and it took quite some time and a lot of paper under the bridge before we could find a common ground. I guess it was around 200 sheets back and forth, testing and rejecting and testing and rejecting. Then once it was up and running, the Kickstarter group was pinned at 217 copies, but a number of these had to be replaced due to the problem of rust particles in the water, as also described in an earlier video bringing the total we had to make for the Kickstarter project to about 300 sheets. Our records show that since then we have sold group by group by group about 1,650 more copies. Now to that we have to normally include, we usually about put 10% or so that we typically call from any particular print run. There might be too much mulberry bark, the printer might have misregistered the first couple of copies and so on and so. But in truth, I suspect that 10% would be a low ball, because when we tot up our accumulated stack of rejected copies of the wave, more about this later, so much mulberry bark, <laughs> we find it contains 469 copies. So totting it all up gives us something like 2,400 sheets pulled from this block set. Now that's a lot of wear and tear on some very finely carved lines. It might seem that the end is nigh. Well, let's have a look at the blocks. It's too difficult to see from there. We'll put the, you know, the side camera view on this. There's a strong misconception out there as to the main cause of wear on this type of woodblock. Now, people who have seen a printer hard at work, like in the video I uploaded last week, vigorously rubbing the baron across the paper, pushing down into the wood, People who've seen this tend to think that it's that part of the process that brings the most wear. But in truth, the baron itself doesn't harm the block much at all. It just squeezes the paper over the wood. It doesn't do any abrading. The real trouble, it's this guy, brushes. You saw in that same video then exactly how it works. The pigment gets splashed onto the wood surface along with the paste and the brush then rubs across the wood, spreading it out into every little nook and cranny. Now, professional printers, of course, try and keep their brushes dressed properly with the tips as fine as possible, but if the body of the brush had no stiffness, the pigment wouldn't spread. And it is this brush hair pushing the pigment particles around on the surface that acts just like sandpaper on the carved lines, wearing them away ever so slightly, stroke by stroke. Now we of course make sure that our pigments are ground as finely as possible to mitigate this as much as we can, but some wear and tear is of course inevitable. It's not just the lines, this happens to the, the edges of all the carved areas, the color zones. Bit by bit, they become rounded over, losing their initial sharpness. Well, how are we doing then? Have we got visible wear on this piece of wood? Yes, indeed. 
What you're looking at here, this is an alternation between photos taken back in 2015 at the point where I had just taken the very first ever impression from the key block. And we're alternating it with photographs taken yesterday afternoon. Now, as you might expect, of course, after pulling some 2,400 impressions, the early crisp sharpness of the cut edges has indeed been lost. Certainly no surprise. There's another dramatic difference between a freshly carved block and one that has been used for a long time, the registration marks. This is something else that viewers of our Twitch stream have seen me work on any number of times. The carver uses his chisels to cut an L-shaped notch near one corner of each block and then a short straight notch at the other end of the wood. These are the places where the printer places the paper to take each impression. And of course, that's how we keep all the color lined up through the entire process. But although these marks start out being perfectly accurate, they don't stay that way for long. The wood over time swells and shrinks, both from changing moisture levels in the air and of course from the effects of being doused with a water-based pigment mix. Our washi paper too, being moistened in order to become primed for absorbing the colors, is extremely susceptible to tiny changes in dimension during the process. The upshot of these two infinitely fluctuating variables is that the printer constantly needs to make adjustments to the registration marks. Here are photos of some of the oldest blocks in use here at Mokohankan. These were not carved by me, but belong to the Doi Hanga Company. Well, look at what has happened to those neat and clear corner marks. They have been adjusted back and forth so many times, it's now anybody's guess as to where the corner really is. Now, our great wave blocks aren't that bad yet, but still, you can see where our printers have put little shims in, pulled them out again, put them in again in a slightly different place, pulled them out again, and again and again and again over the years. Now, actually, what you are seeing here on our blocks is not so bad. When I received the block set back here the other day, among my questions for young Yamamoto-san, the recent printer on this set, was this point specifically. What do you think, guy? Should I cut them out, route them out, insert fresh wood, and cut some new fresh clean marks? He brushed me away. He said, no, don't bother. These are fine. And anyway, new ones, they just get messed up again real soon. <laughs> it's just part and parcel of a printer's life. Our printing crew upstairs here at Mokohankan doesn't have much experience with moving these marks, nor do I myself actually, because for the most part we are using freshly carved blocks, which are quite stable. And our subscription prints are also fairly small in dimension, making those expansions and contractions less of a critical issue for us. Something else, when inspecting these blocks this week, I came across another place that could cause trouble for the printers. Look at this photo. You can see how the wood has split at one point. This is something we are seeing more often these days. Because we're using thin cherry laminated to a plywood substrate, we see splitting like this now and again. Now in this particular case, it's not going to be a problem. And indeed, it doesn't even show up in the finished prints at all because this is a place where all three blue blocks overlap, filling in the gap. And actually, in the case of a little split like this, the gap almost always closes up as soon as printing begins, as the wood swells from the effect of the moisture in the pigment mix. And that's what saves us in the case of another problem. This one is a big deal. At first, it, when you first see this, it just looks like a complete deal killer. This is the extra lettering block that I introduced back in episode 15. My first attempt to carve the cartouche lettering on a small boxwood insert had not been satisfactory, so I had recut the letters onto a larger piece of boxwood. Now, boxwood is cool stuff. It will allow a very fine detail to be carved but it's dangerous, and I mean explosively dangerous. 
the boxwood that I used some 25 years ago or so as I inlay in a number of my Sudimono album prints, it was beautifully seasoned old wood and it's behaved itself very well, staying quietly in place where it belongs. Those were the days. But this piece, as you can see, was far more rebellious. It's like whatever kids these days. <laughs> now look at these cracks. This block is dead. Surely it's dead. Well, actually, no, not at all. Have a look at this photo of another carved boxwood block. This is the key block for the first print in our wood block pilgrimage series. I took a very, very large gamble when I made this one, using boxwood for the entire surface of the image. It was totally and completely foolish. I just didn't have a decent, usable piece of cherry at hand, but my deadline was right there. And yes, I paid for my foolishness. As you can see, one dry day, she popped right open. Now it's funny, I hadn't noticed this. This much have happened when the block set was wrapped up and on the shelf. And I only found out about this when I got a call from Kawaii-san, our printer living out in the countryside in Nagano. We had sent her the blocks and paper, and then she phoned me the next day after receiving them. Dave, like we have a problem. <laughs> But actually, now both she and I have had a bit of experience with this, and we knew what to do. She got a cloth, moistened it with warm water, placed it on the table, put the block face down on it, changed the water now and again to keep it warm. And a few hours later, after drinking its fill, that crack had closed. The block became flat, and she went ahead with her printing. And that's exactly how Yamamoto-san has been handling this cracked cartouche for our great wave. As long as you let it drink, it will cooperate. None of the recent prints made from this block show even the slightest trace of that crack. So that's the overall situation with the block set itself. It's kind of hanging in there very well, I think. But customers, fans, collectors, they don't see the blocks. They don't care about our struggles or descent. They see the prints. How do the most recent prints compare with the ones we made six years ago? How much of the wear and tear from that wood that we saw is visible in the prints? Can we keep publishing from those blocks? And if so, for how long? We have data. I mentioned earlier that we have here a stack of more than 450 prints that were rejected for various reasons. Perhaps there was too much mulberry bark in the paper. Perhaps there were trials, tests, or perhaps it does happen, you know, there were slip-ups by the printers. We have quite the stack of prints. And what is, oops, 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 drop it, why don't you, Dave? What is really cool about it, this is documented. Each time we run a batch of prints, there's been rejected copies. I don't just toss them, I put them into one of these envelopes along with a little slip of paper. Yamamoto, July 2021. This is the most recent batch. 469 of them. When you actually think about this, my guess is that never in the history of Ukiwe printing has there ever been such a record kept. I guess it's possible that deep in the warehouse of some other publisher somewhere, they might have similar piles of rejected prints, but my guess is that for most of them, right throughout history, when inspecting a batch of prints, it was binary. Sell it! Toss it. But I'm, I guess, a little bit of a rat pack, and for better or for worse, here we are. When you think about it, I guess at this point, I own the world's largest collection of hand-carved, hand-printed copies of Hoax size, great wave. Shall we call the Guinness people? <laughs> now, actually, I cleaned this up for making this video. You know, I haven't looked at this stuff for years, but for getting this ready now, I went through this. I put them in order and I pulled one sheet from each envelope, trying to select prints that would provide a constant view of the changes for us not copies that were misregistered or distorted. Mostly the ones I selected are completely fine from the printing point of view, but there's either, as I said, too much bark or, or, or a blot like this one or something like that that spoiled it for selling. I have in that group 35 of them, all carefully labeled and in order. Now, I know already what you are yelling at your screen right now, and yes, 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 we're on to it. Our staff member Watanabe-san is already partway through the project getting the entire stack printed at a 
photographed at a fairly reasonable resolution, 300 dpi or something. And we will soon get, soon get them online. That's not going to happen. We will get them online for anybody to inspect. Details on where you'll be able to see them will be in the video description when we finally do get them up. But here for this presentation, it would be overwhelming to go through all 35 steps. You can't see much change from one to the other. So for this, I'm going to select three prints. One from the batch made for the Kickstarter project. One from the time when I brought you the previous video about block wear and tear, when I estimated we had printed around a thousand copies. And one from Yamamoto-san's most recent batch, printed around two weeks ago. Now, waving them around in front of the camera will tell us nothing, so I'm going to get them under our new camera setup, prepare some side-by-side -side shots, and let's see what the close-ups tell us. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the cartouche on this print has gone through two versions. Here in a print from 2015, one of the prints from the Kickstarter campaign, the cartouche is the original one carved on the thin piece of boxwood that I inlaid into the cherry of the key block. It didn't last long at all. The carving was fine, and still is all these years later, but the small slip of wood was just too unstable for the printers to manage. The 2017 version here is the replacement. I of course used the same original tracing to guide my carving, but comparing them closely now, I see that the newer one is overall a bit fatter in the lines. This is clearly visible in the outer box, but also in the calligraphy at the lower part. I've talked in other videos about, uh, you know, I did it better the second time, <laughs> but I don't honestly think that is the case here. As for 2021, there's a slight bit of thickening on the outer box, but I suspect this is not so much from the lines themselves getting wider, but from Yamamoto's on the printer having to press a bit firmer in order to get a smooth, rich impression. This area is too wide to show all three at once, so we'll look at them in turn. I should mention too, for people who want to compare these closely, we have uploaded all these images to our website, where you can see them at very high resolution. Information on where to find them will be in the video description. Just as with the cartouche a moment ago, for the first pair we are not comparing exactly the same thing. As described in one of the previous videos, in order to deal with one of the many problems encountered during production of this print, I had to recut part of the block for printing the middle blue. The 2015 version here is the original block, but by 2017 we were using the second version. I suspect though that if I hadn't mentioned this, it would not really be apparent, but when you look extremely closely, you can see tiny differences here and there. Let's go back and forth. Here's 2015 again, then to 2017. And then here, the block we are using now in 2021. The area in the boat, you know, the brush strokes of the straw mats, this is an area where I had expected quite early degradation of this block. But I have to say I am very, very pleased at how it's standing up, even after 2400 printings. The main curl of the wave is another area that can be touchy. Both the brush and the barren are unsupported here, next to the wide open sky area. And it is very easy for a slight moment of carelessness by the printer to result in thickened lines at this point. The comparison from 2015 to 17 doesn't show any dramatic change, I think. But when we move to 2021, Look at the top crest of the wave here. You can see a slight fuzziness in the line where the wood is starting to give way a bit when compared with the two previous versions. The mountain itself is, of course, one of the most important parts of the image. And unfortunately for the printer, this particular spot is tough to handle. The sky here gets printed at least twice, once in light gray and then again in a richer black, but it is not uncommon for the printer to do the black in two passes to get it nice and smooth. But each time you print a gradation on a block with holes carved in it, like here for the white foam, you stand increasing chance of clogging some of them up. The 27 copy we see here has a sky a tad lighter than the one from 2015. 
This is nothing specific to the block condition, just an example of a natural amount of variation between printing runs. As with the previous comparison, if you look very closely at the line work on this 2021 version, you can detect places here and there where the lines show the same slight fuzziness, where the wood is starting to lose body. But you really have to hunt for them. Okay, this next one is the main event here. When it comes to beaten up copies of the Great Wave, this is the part of the print where it really starts to come apart. The wooden structure at the end of the boat is the place that gives printers nightmares. It's exposed. It's delicate. It's made up of fine lines separating very thin internal areas that must be kept clear of pigment. And it's all happening right next to that thick black gradation. If you had asked me back in 2015 if we would ever be able to pull a print this clean from blocks that had done 2400 impressions, I would have just laughed at you. A thousand copies? Maybe. 1500 copies? I don't know. 2400? Don't make me laugh. <laughs> and yet, here it is. Young Yamamoto-san and our blocks have pulled it off. And not just with a single copy here, of course, sheet after sheet after sheet. Okay, to finish off this part of our inspection, something a bit different. We're not focusing on the fine lines in this example, but on some places that were deliberately carved in a fuzzy manner. You can see this here on the upper surface of the blue water areas. The blocks were intentionally carved roughly and slightly beveled over to give a more, hopefully, naturalistic effect to the water. It's known as Itabokashi, block gradation. And we can clearly see here now that the 2015 version, printed from totally fresh blocks, isn't actually as attractive as the 2017 version. The roughness is just a bit too rough. But by 2017, the blocks had kind of aged a bit and the effect is more pleasant. Thinking about it now, I guess this is a reflection of my own inexperience. I think if I had had more previous chances to do this, I would have got it a bit nicer straight off the bat, instead of my blocks having to wear into it. And now in 2021, it's still looking fine. No problems with block wear and tear in this region. So there we are then. Do recent prints show evidence of block wear? Yes, I guess so. No, I can't, I can't deny it. Of course they do. Do I think that the level of wear we see means these blocks should now be retired? Well, I think there are two quite distinct points of view here. The, the money-grabbing commercial viewpoint of publisher Dave here says, sheesh, nobody's even going to notice. Roll on. But what does the printmaker with pride Dave say? Well, you know, he also is okay with this. The third print in those comparison photos, this one, is a beautiful, beautiful woodblock print. I'll ship this out with pride. I could at this point, for comparison here, I could show you something like this. This particular copy of the Great Wave, it lives in the British Museum, a very honorable place to be. It was out on the market at one point. So the publisher must have still been selling it even in that condition. Looking at this, don't you think mine has a long way to go before we get to that level of wear and tear? <laughs> no, but of course, that's not a fair comparison. Our market and the old Edo era market are two completely different environments. I'm promising our fans that we are sending them prints that reflect an overall philosophy of the best that we can make. So where then do we draw the line? Now, I don't pass every print that comes across my desk. Misregistration like you see here, of course, immediately out. A small streak of misplaced pigment, out. Just too much mulberry bark, regrettably, this too, out. But once those have been culled, I then go through again to try and make sure I haven't overlooked anything, and then I send them over to our shipping center in Ome from where they will be sent out to their new owners. People who've been waiting, in the best case, for something over a year, but sometimes as long as two years. Now there's actually a little bit of restoration work that I can do on the block set at this point. I'm gonna get the key block under my microscope and touch up some of the lines that have been slightly widened. 
I'm also going to open up some of the white areas that indicate foam to make them less likely to catch pigment blots. There's also a place on one of the blocks where the underlying laminations are starting to give way and I will get that screwed down securely so it doesn't cause any more problems. I will also use my, uh, my Nagura. It's a little type of delicate soft stone we have to dress the cherry wood in a few places where the surface has become slightly roughened by uneven degradation of the wood fibers. After that little facelift, I will then send the block set out to our printer Chihadu Kawai who is eagerly waiting her chance to have a crack at this one. She'll become the fourth printer to work on the Mokohankan Great Wave. She is a very, very fine printer, more skilled than I, and I have no doubt at all that the batch of prints she sends me a few weeks from now will be more than acceptable to receive the Mokohankan embossing, of which we will adjust, of course, to include her name as the printer. Now, how much are we gonna charge for those prints? exactly the same price that we have kept through the entire history of this edition from the moment the Kickstarter campaign opened. And given that we have a waiting list for these prints that currently runs to four figures, the first of which is not a one, the bean counters all tell me the same thing. Raise the price! Would people pay more? We've already seen this on the secondary market, actually. We've had people who have bought this print from us after waiting online for more than a year sometime, then turned around and resold it for triple or quadruple the price. Now, I myself, I'm dead set on not changing the price. Our costs are covered now. We have a fair margin in there, and our business as a whole is basically profitable. But there is a very strong argument that I am cheating the printers by keeping the price down. The huge demand for this print is a demand for their work. Now, given that I could clearly double the price and we would still be not able to keep up with demand, aren't I cheating the printers out of honestly earned revenue? I just don't know. So what I have done in recent years since this thing blew up is this. I have incrementally, about year by year, steadily raise the amount we pay the printers per sheet for the Great Wave. And I'll do so again this month when I receive the next batch from Kawaii-san. We are now paying, as far as I can ascertain, we're now paying about three times the going rate from other publishers for a print of this type. Charity for the printers? No way. Mokohan can, can afford to do this because we have a secret sauce. Sauces, actually. Point number one here, unlike other publishers, we don't have to give wholesale discounts. Our prints are not for sale in museum shops or any other retail locations. That's a huge advantage for us, straight from our shipping center right to you. Second point, unlike other publishers here in Tokyo, we are not carrying a huge layer of, in Japanese they call them eigyo man. These are the guys in suits and ties with a briefcase. They get on the train and fan out around the city and country to try and flog the prints. We deal, as I said, directly, me to you. We don't need that level of salesman in between. There's a third important point. Unlike almost every other publisher here, we don't have some extensive middle layer of accounting staff. We have a kind of funky but pretty efficient IT system in place here. It's a work in progress. It's not always perfect, but it is perfectly matched to our requirements, something impossible to get with packaged software. Customer clicks on something in our online shopping cart, makes the payment, and bang, that's the last bookkeeping entry required all the way down to the very end of our financial year when it prints out ready for making our tax forms. Now, even good software like this can't do it all, of course, but we have another secret weapon at hand in our customer service area. I hear from customers now and then that they did have a problem with a transaction, but it was solved by something they referred to as a, a Cameron. I kind of remember Cameron. You know, it's been so long now, though. We've been teleworking now for the last, what is it, 16 months. I can't quite remember all the people. Anyway, enough fooling. I really should look into what is happening there. <laughs> okay. Anyway, the final point, wherever I got to, three, four, five, I don't remember. Unlike all the other publishers, we do not carry a top-heavy level of executives with all the expense that entails. 
Now, enough of that, enough of the money stuff. Let's move along and get this wrapped up. There's one more very, very important point to address. So far, so good on our great wave, but what of the future? Our block set may not be ready for retirement just yet, but that day is actually clearly drawing closer. What will we do when it arrives? Well, as you might expect, we aren't just waiting for the end. I'm thinking that with proper care and attention, we'll be able to pull quite a few more prints from my carved block. But while we are doing that, we have begun preparation work on the next generation. Not another touch-up of these blocks, but an entire new set carved fresh. I'm going to do this all over again? No. It's not that I wouldn't enjoy the challenge. We've talked about this kind of thing before in different videos. It's just that it doesn't make any sense. It's much more useful for me to use my time to work on new projects. And at the same time, it would be a wonderful challenge for one of the younger members of our team. Not everybody here at Mokohankan is as eager to sit in front of a camera as I am. And I'm sorry to report that so it is with both of the younger carvers who have been working with us since I opened Mokohankan. I guess actually it clearly goes with the territory. There's something about the carver's job that seems to attract people who wrap themselves up in the work, lock the door and like they're, go away and leave me alone. I speak from decades of experience on this as viewers of my previous videos trying to get time with an older carver. Anyway, anyway, anyway. But you saw this print we published a couple of years ago. Look at the carving. The lines, very tasty. The registration, perfect. And an overall sense of unity across the sheet. Or how about this from the same young man on our carving staff? Now I should be careful what I show you here. Perhaps everybody is going to cancel their position on the waiting list for my great wave to get on the waiting list for the one carved by this young man. Now he is ready and he has actually already begun preparation taking my original tracing file and working over places where he feels that Dave's brushwork leaves kind of something to be desired. <laughs> we already have a piece of wood set aside for the key block and it shouldn't be too long now before he actually starts putting knife to wood. Now he's not going to work on it as his major project just yet. We are far too busy and we need his skill set for our day-to-day -day publication schedules. But he will spend time on it now and again moving the project forward bit by bit with the idea that he will have his new block set ready by the time that my block set comes to the final end of the line. But this brings up a fun question. Will people want his version, our future Great Wave, the one not carved by Dave? My answer to that is very, very easy. I hope this doesn't come as earth-shattering, disappointing news to you, but when you think of a Mr. Daniels, a certain famous Mr. J. Daniels, he didn't actually make that bottle of bourbon that you have on your shelf, even though his name is on it. In a similar field, the, the Colonel, he didn't make any of the fried chicken in that bucket you had last week. But they were real men. Men who, as we understand it, they did have a vision about what a good bourbon should be or what makes something really, really finger licking good. And their job was to do two things. To, of course, work hard themselves making those products while they were still capable of it. But on top of that, they had to work to build a culture that was capable of making the product. A culture that understood what made that thing special and a culture that would continue making it to those high standards even after the key man had left the stage. I'm working hard at both of those jobs. Am I capable of successfully carrying out the second one, creating the overall culture? Only time will tell. And I myself, actually, I'll never know whether or not I succeeded. Well, too heavy. Enough of this. We've had a good video here, we've had a good chat. See you next time and thanks for watching.